The factual report is out on the S35 crash at Telluride just, uh, just over two years and a month ago. And uh, let's see what the investigation developed. Hi, I'm Scott Purdue, and today on Flywire, we're going to take a look at the factual report and other documents that are in the docket for the S35 that crashed above Bridal Veil Falls on 5 October 2020, just eight minutes after takeoff from Telluride, Colorado. I did a video on this uh, after it happened. So generally it takes a couple of years for the NTSB to produce a report after an accident. And uh, for this accident, that timeline hasn't changed at all. In fact, the final report is not out. This is just the factual. Uh, and what I'm gonna do is compare what I said in the, in the first video and correct what I got wrong. Okay, we'll see. I'm not gonna redo what I showed in the first video. Please go and look at that. I'll put a link up here uh, for you to go look at that uh, first video so you can get a better picture of the entire story for this accident if you haven't seen it before. Uh, the weather at the accident site was uh, pretty much clear with winds from 15, uh, about 15 knots from the west. Uh, no significant weather and likely, according to the weather people, little turbulence wasn't relevant. I projected that the gross weight of the accident airplane was about 3,000 pounds and the airframe examination put the gross weight at 3,000 pounds after refueling with 30 gallons of fuel right before the accident flight takeoff. There were no known radio or distress calls made from the accident airplane. Then they jumped into the airframe examination and it revealed impact damage all along the leading edges of the wings and most of the forward section uh, of the fuselage was crushed in an upward direction. The wreckage was moved to a secure facility in Colorado and approximately five months after the accident, the airframe and engine were laid out on a hangar floor and examined by investigators. The left wing was broken aft, presumably uh, the spar was broken during the impact sequence and the spar had been cut at the root during recovery, so it was not attached to the airplane anymore after the recovery. The fuel batter is in the leading edge and it was broken completely, and the wing tip was broken aft and separated from the airplane. The left flap was connected to the wing. It was bent and buckled and in the up position. That's what the factual report noted. The left aileron was disconnected and bent longitudinally. It was kind of curled up in a curlicue. Uh, so allow me an observation here. The airframe factual report is strictly reporting what the investigators saw on the hangar floor. This must be compared to the pictures taken at the crash site before the accident, the aircraft was moved. In this picture of the left side of the airplane, you can see a significant gap at the left flap and the aileron is missing completely from the picture. Back to the hangar floor picture and note that the bent broken off wing tip and the crush, uh, crush marks and slash striations along the leading edge. That, the failure of the spar is at the aileron and uh, flap break, and the, that's where the break in the wing is, and it's consistent. Those marks and that break is basically consistent with rotation and impact. Okay, let's, and nose low left rotation. Let's look at the right wing crash site, uh, the, Let's look at the right wing crash side picture. Note that the flap is down and also note that the interior window frame and the left aileron here is located aft uh, of the at rest wreckage and on the right side of the fuselage. And this I think supports my theory of a stall spin accident. The uh, toxicology examination of the pilot's blood was done and there was, they, were, they were negative for drugs and alcohol. An unmeasured amount of antihistamine, the antihistamine Allegra, was detected, but Allegra is an FA approved antihistamine, not a factor. It also highlights the sheer necessity, I think this also highlights the sheer necessity of a, as many photographs as possible of the evidence of the crash site, because just examining that left wing on the hangar floor would uh, obscure the fact that the flaps were down prior to impact. And I think that's a critical uh, part of this accident sequence. The leading edge shows severe impact damage all along the leading edge, though on the right side. The wingtip was also broken aft and partially separated, still, still connected. 
the right flap was connected and bent and it was in the up position. The cockpit and cabin area were broken open and crushed upward. And from my perspective, this is consistent with a forward impact at an angle less than vertical. Vertical, the crush would have been this way. Forward would have been that direction. Okay, so angle less than vertical. The throttle, propeller, and mixture controls were all full forward. The baggage compartment was bent and buckled, and the fuselage aft was intact to the empennage. The V-tail stabilizers were intact, and the left one is still attached to the fuselage in the picture. The right one had been removed for transport. It was not, it was not broken off. The rudder vaders showed little damage as well. During the engine inspection, it was noted that the fuselage and cowling uh, beneath the engine were all crushed upwards in this direction, uh, and the front of the engine case was broken. So that means there's a fairly steep, but nose, you know, nose low, but fairly steep angle, 70 degrees-ish or so. It was broken aft and, and fragmented and exposed the crankshaft, the camshaft, and the connecting rods to number five and six cylinders. Rotation scoring was observed on the hub and the flange consistent with rotation at impact. The throttle body was still attached and crushed upward into the engine. Throttle body is about midpoint or so of the engine. The propeller hub was broken and only two blades were present for examination. The third blade uh, had not been recovered, but the retaining hub was, and it showed severe impact damage and no evidence of pre-impact failure. Both uh, blades that were there exhibited S-bending and cord-wise scratching and other impact damage that were consistent with rotation and impact. So the engine was turning, was running at impact. This is a quick summation of the contents in the docket and the factual report. It's unknown where, or excuse me, when the final report will be released. We'll wait and see. There was no conclusion as to the final moments, there was no speculation at all about the, uh, about the flight, just the facts. And whether the accident, uh, there was no conclusion whether it was a stall spin or a sea fit. But I can tell you from the evidence that I am very confident that this was a stall spin accident and an understandable one in my opinion. Things were not working out as the pilot expected and his reaction was a normal human reaction which, you know, is I don't want this ha to happen. Which, and unfortunately, that is in fact the wrong reaction, but it's understandable. And without training, uh, I don't think most people can avoid that. In the previous video I did on this accident, I went with the assumption that the pilot intended to cr crest that mountain range, ridge about three miles east of him when he crested the falls, over 2,000 feet to climb. I really couldn't understand why the pilot did that, nor why the flaps were down. Putting flaps down in to half, which is about where they were, is not a trivial thing to do in a 12-volt Bonanza. There isn't a setting for it. You have to do it on purpose and it takes about 8 to 10 seconds. After the video was posted, I received a lot of background information that I held on to until now. Uh, the purpose of the flight I can say that the purpose of the flight was not a departure to the east and headed home, and that is the, is the issue. The critical factor was uh, that, that first sightseeing flight that was done in the morning before the accident flight. It did indeed incorporate sightseeing, but I would say that more than that, it was a scouting flight. The passengers aboard the aircraft were the wedding photographers from the wedding the day before, and they were looking for a suitable place to photograph the couple in the airplane from the ground. I think they found it just before they landed. They flew right through Ingram Basin from east to west and then over Bridal Veil Falls on the way to Telluride where they landed. And there's a road that climbs the ridge and tops out at the falls. It would be possible for the photographers to get close enough to the falls to capture the S-35s that flew east uh, to west over the falls. I'm not sure how the perspective works out and how you could actually get the falls in that. You'd have to be some distance away and use a long lens. We'll see. I mean, I, I don't know. But it would, have been, it would have been a dramatic shot and undoubtedly 
uh, a romantic picture as well. In order to make that shot happen, the pilot did not want excess altitude in the basin, just enough to clear the terrain and make that turn back towards the valley. Par partial flaps would have actually helped him make that turn inside the basin. So it was, I don't think he ever planned to climb over it. He planned to turn around in it. And as long as the pilot did not bust altitudes for clearing structures and large gatherings of people, this is Class G airspace, there was nothing that I can see that's illegal about the photo shoot. The issues I mentioned in the first video centered on density altitude. And I think that's still, that's still the issue. Performance degrades significantly with altitude. That goes for a normally aspirated engine that was in the IO520, that was in the accident airplane, as well as a turbocharged, as a turbocharged engine at a DA of 13,700 feet. There just isn't enough air for the wing to perform at that altitude as it would at sea level. High DA is a killer, and there is no margin for error in that situation when you've got big mountains right next to you. There's no altitude to take up, make up for mistakes. My heart is still broken for this young couple their friends and family. Flying is amazing and fun, but it is serious business. And there's no fooling around with physics. There just isn't. In the previous video, I mentioned the red flag before, uh, red flag briefing that I heard many times about the risk of doing something dumb, different, and dangerous. And I'm afraid that this photo mission violated all three. And I just don't see any other way around it. Could have been done safely. Not the first time around. I think maybe it could have been. Probably yes. But it would have required an intimate knowledge of how the airframe performed at the expected DAs, at the high DAs that the uh, event happened. The turn rates and turn radiuses uh, and how they matched to the uh, terrain in the Ingram Basin. Um, in other words, you've got to practice that and know that before you go and do it in the actual real world. Some of the questions that would require answering would be ones like, does the turn radius match the terrain? What effect does turbulence have or adverse winds have on the turn? And it was 15 knots from the west that's pushing them into the basin. That's a problem. Uh, how much margin for error is there for a level turn? Would a higher altitude work with a descending turn back to the west, clearing terrain, clearing the terrain with a larger safety margin, uh, those kind of planning issues. Uh, where to place the photographers for the best view and the ability to capture the shot without endangering the airplane and the people in it. So when you approach something you haven't done before, the best method is to study it, take it apart, and approach each segment in detail methodically. Whether that's airplanes or cars and, or life, I'm not, maybe that applies to everything. but definitely for airplanes. You, you reduce your risk by planning. You think it through and use training to prepare for the real deal. You may not know that the flying scenes, if you've seen the movie Top Gun, you may not know those flying scenes took over a year to plan and practice for. And then each event was done maybe 25 times, I've heard, before calling it good. These were all, there, there was a lot of risky flying done in that movie, but every precaution and risk were mitigated as best as possible before shooting took place. I think the takeaway, besides the dangers of high DA, is that when something sounds like a good idea and it's not something you're intimately familiar with, then the best course of action is to step back, get serious about planning, and practicing for that event, okay? Don't make it up as you go along, please. Humans rarely do well making, making it up as they go along, and just about anything but definitely in flying. So it's training, practice, knowledge, experience that makes the difference in survival here. Not saying the guy wasn't an experienced pilot, but not that kind of a turn in high DA situation. So I hope you enjoyed this video and the update to this tragic accident. If you'd like to subscribe, it looks a bit like this here. And I'd like also to thank my Patreon supporters here. I appreciate your support. Y'all be safe out there. Thanks for watching. And I'll see you next time on Flywire.